now we go to the uh, to the German architect uh, whom I presented a few times, um, Gottfried Zemper, uh, an important, uh, in my opinion, a very important architect and a very important uh, uh, thinker about architecture. So he was not born on the 15th, he died on the 15th of May in 1879. So he was 76 years old when he died. Uh, some pictures with him. He was also a revolutionary. At one moment, he had to flee uh, Germany because, because I guess the revolution was, uh, was defeated. So the revolutionary had to fight for his life and leave. Um, but, but he was an activist, he was militant. He was not just a passive uh, contemplator of what uh, was happening then. I don't know the, the details, but uh, he was certainly a passionate man. He even has here a sculpture of himself, not like Erasmus with a book, but like a true architect with a set of plans, I guess. So he began his professional career as a mathematician and some other architects did the same thing. Introduced to architecture by these uh, people, began work in Dresden in Germany and took part in the Dresden uprising in 1849. So when he was 46 years old, uh, published the four elements of architecture in 1851. He was a leading architectural theorist of the 19th century on polychromy and polychromy in antiquity. Later worked in Zurich, Switzerland and Vienna, Austria. He even built some buildings there in Zurich for the famous uh, School of Architecture, ETH. Uh, so, um, again, uh, another, <laughs> another portrait of him. Uh, you know, I guess he maybe he was not married or he didn't have someone to help him with his buttons. This one seems to be, um, you know, to. <laughs> To belong with the, with a, to an architect, uh, not to an architect actually. And I, I, I look at the look at the thick wool of his um, uh, coat. This reminds me a little bit of uh, some kind of clothing that uh, you know peasants actually used to wear in, um, in Transylvania in certain parts, you know, Muncia Pusen and so on. Anyway, and this seemed to be a little bit worn out. But it's okay, it's fine. This is in fact, uh, I think I admire that a very famous architect was not, uh, you know, uh, exempt from, um, you know, the passage of time or the vagaries of uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, unhappy <clears throat> little happenings anyway. So, Godfrey Semper. Some drawings by him. He published those books, uh, and uh, you expect them to be polychromatic indeed, because he valued the, the, the color. And I don't know if it might be that he was the one who advocated the idea that the ancient temples, even those of Greece, were actually highly chromatic. They were colored, they were not white. And um, he was an innovator, he took risks himself. And uh, he valued a lot um, uh, ornamentation. And, uh, and uh, I think he's very important for the fact that he, uh, he kind of uh, indirectly in a way uh, advocated the feminization of architecture. If by weaving, uh, we, we remember that the, the goddesses of weaving were all women, and the second part of the word uh, architecture or architecture or whatever, in whatever language, texture comes from text, which means to weave. And this is, I think, very, very interesting. Um, so, ornaments. Ornaments, those hated ornaments by, the, my, by modernists, but... Uh, <laughs> They are coming back, you know, there is always uh, room for, for what was once banished to return. 
But one thing is for sure, if you look back in the history of architecture, you cannot eliminate ornament. It's impossible. Uh, it was present from the, from the caves all the way to, to, to our day continuously. So there must be some, some importance attached to, uh, to the presence of ornament in architecture. Uh, you know, why are we studying the history of architecture if we neglect, uh, you know, fundamental thing? I think we impoverished architecture terribly when, when we divorced architect, uh, structure from ornament. It is true there was a reason why the reaction, the negative reaction to ornament at the beginning of the 20th century. Yes, it was a reaction against um, excessive uh, eclecticism, the, yeah, the excesses of, uh, of um, decoration, but um, to banish it completely is uh, equally an excess and equally uh, unfortunate. So there were, there were great uh, architects in the 19th century who, who uh, advocated uh, the cause of the ornament very strongly. You see, this is in the, an, orna, an Egyptian ornament. Uh, why did they do it? Why did the Egyptians so-called lose their time doing ornamental work? Well, because they didn't have TVs and they didn't lay on their sofas and they didn't watch soap operas. That's why they had time to do ornaments. We don't because we are busy with all kinds of nonsensical shows on TV. Uh, <clears throat> there is this website, uh, which is a good website, the ResearchGate, where you can see lots of materials about him. Uh, he also was interested, and I'm not very sure why. I mean, I, I think I know why to an extent. In knots, seam and twining. Uh, it's um, from this book, Der Stil, the style from 1860. Uh, I, I have an instinctive or instinctual liking for knots. Uh, and uh, it has to do with uh, weaving in a way, you know, with intertwining, with bringing together, uh, not in a mechanical way, but in a more organic way. This is a page from, from, from that book, and you wonder why was he interested in this? Um, but the intricacies of detail, the intricacies of, of, of ornaments are uh, um, appreciable. And then I, I think they, they uh, I don't know, they incite me, you know? I, I really think we impoverished architecture terribly when we, when, when we uh, got rid of, uh, of the riches of ornament. This is a fragment from a Greek temple, right? Well, it was not white. Color is life, like actually, you know? Where well, one is grayish and pale, uh, that's not a sign of health, you know? <laughs> so uh, we shouldn't be afraid of color, I think, at all. Nor, on, nor ornament. Uh, it's hard to go back to the ornament, but some uh, interesting schools of architecture are doing just that now, and not just the schools, some practices of architecture as well. Okay, the four elements of architecture. This was a book, another book he, 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 he wrote. And this was his idea that, that the primeval hut had four primeval architectural elements, the hearth, the roof, the enclosure, and the mound. And I said this, I, I, I recounted this story and maybe I should do it again. And I apologize for repeating a story I already told a few times, but maybe something worth, um, uh, you know, repeating. He asked himself, how did the first building ever came into being? And he said, uh, 
some uh, huntermen, some fishermen, they returned from work and they gathered around fire. That's all they had. They didn't yet have a house or a home. They just had fire. Now, if that fire was brought to them by Prometheus, I don't know, but they had fire and they understood that fire is vital to their survival. They cannot live without fire. So they had to protect it. But how? They didn't have electrical machines to cut down trees or they didn't have the tools. So they just uh, uh, took some vegetable material, you know, some leaves uh, and branches of whatever they found around themselves, and they began to weave them. And thus they created panels which approximated some kind of enclosures that protected the, the fire all around it. And then they understood also that fire should be elevated a little bit from the earth to protect it from floods and from animals. So they created the mound. And then uh, the hearth represented fire. That was the, 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 what was to, to be protected. The hearth was, uh, was where the fire was and it, it just remained to be protected above with a roof and then the roof came into being. But he thought that the, 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 the first architectural uh, gesture was actually the enclosure and it was done through weaving. Uh, and uh, um, so I don't know if I should read this. So, okay, let me try. The Four Elements of Architecture is a book by the German architect Gottfried Semper, published in 1851, so 170 years ago. It is an attempt to explain the origins of architecture through the lens of anthropology. The book divides architecture into four distinct elements, the hearth, the roof, the enclosure, and the mound. The origins of each element can be found in the traditional crafts of ancient so-called barbarians. Hearth is metallurgy and ceramics, roof, carpentry, enclosure, textile, weaving, mound, earthwork. Semper stated that the hearth was the first element created. Well, yeah, but that's what the fire was. But uh, in another place, I read that actually the enclosure is considered the first, uh, the weaving is the first architectural gesture. The first sign of settlement and rest after the hunt, the battle, and wandering in the desert is today, as when the first man lost paradise, the setting up of the fireplace and the lighting of the reviving warming and food preparing flame. Around the hearth, the first groups formed. Around the hearth, the first groups assembled. Around it, the first alliances formed. Around it, the first rude religious concepts were put into the customs of a cult. And Zemper continues, throughout all phases of society, the hearth formed that sacred focus around which took order and shape. It is the first and most important element of architecture, fire, the hearth. Around it were grouped the other three elements, the roof, the enclosure, and the mound. The protecting negations or defenders of the hearth's flame against three hostile, hostile elements of nature. And here we see the hearth in this uh, dark um, you know, circle. And then we see the mound on which the, the heart was placed. Uh, and then uh, the enclosure, which is woven, is here, and then the roofing. Uh, so the four elements. The origin of each element can be found in the traditional crafts of ancient society. The hearth is fire and ceramics. The roof, carpentry. The enclosure, weaving. And the mound, stone masonry. Now, a student sent me this very interesting diagram. I don't know if he discovered it, but it shows that all the derivations of the word architecture come from text, which means to, weigh, to weave in Proto-Indo-European language. This is very interesting because the, the second part of the word architect or architecture and so on is actually, it derives from to weave from text, and you see here in various languages. So 
I mean, the word is still used today, even in Romania, you know, uh, the urban fabric in English, uh, uh, you know, Tsesutul Urban. Uh, so it is about Atsete, to weave. And I think the implications of this are very, very um, complex and very subtle and very wide. Uh, I have another presentation. I don't have it prepared with me here. Uh, architecture and weaving, and weaving, but maybe I can uh, show it some other time, or I could search for it after this presentation on uh, on sample. Now, um, so, um, well, I guess this thing is uh, is is clear. Maybe I just I just observed now that. Because of the, the of the fact that that the words relating to architecture derive from to weave, from text, there is also a connection between architecture and writing. That is text. You see here text. Text is derives also from text. So maybe there is some subtle. Uh, uh, organic uh, ancient relationship between writing and architecture as well through text through the act of weaving you weave words you, you weave uh, uh, letters and you weave uh, whatever material in order to create uh, that enclosure to protect fire it's all about weaving uh, I think this is very interesting, and I I, I always uh, uh, am thankful to that student who sent me this uh, uh, this diagram. Now in Dresden, what did uh, Godfrey Zemper build? Uh, he built a, a theater in 1838, 1849, which uh, 41, which was destroyed by he, but he rebuilt it. It was uh, it was destroyed by fire, and. Um, a large building. Uh, he also built some very large buildings in Vienna, in Austria. So he was quite a quite a, an, an acknowledged uh, architect. Since you know, after leaving Austria, he built in uh, Zurich, in Switzerland, and also built in Vienna, uh, very significant buildings. Fire. That very fire that, that creates life and makes life possible could also be a, a source of anguish and great uh, disasters. Wright himself, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, always placed at the center of his buildings, uh, the domestic buildings uh, in general, uh, fire, the hearth, uh, the chimney. But um, he was punished himself by fire. Twice, Frank Lloyd Wright, and tragically, in fact, in one of the the two events, he lost the woman he was in love with. They were not married at the time. It was uh, it happened at Talies and uh, East. Uh, he was in Chicago at the time, and uh, I don't know what happened. Uh, a person in his service, a black man, uh, he uh, set fire to the house, and then when people tried to escape the fire. He would decapitate them, and uh, he lost Frank Lloyd Wright, lost uh, the, the woman he loved, and also her sons, her two sons, who were not uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's sons, were from the previous marriage, but um, all three were, you know, were, were were killed in that tragedy. And then later, I don't know how many years later, there was another fire that broke at Talies and East. And this time uh, he lost less. He lost uh, less. Uh, he just lost uh, a great collection of uh, Japanese woodcuts. That is um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. Anyway, um, so yes, there is uh, Heraclitus. Heraclitus thought that um, fire was is the father of all things. That's how he described fire. The father of all things, uh, and um, it's also, you know, is the great creator, but as we saw, also a great uh, uh, destructor. 
anyway, uh, this building was built, rebuilt by Gottfried uh, Semper. Uh, this was Villa Rosa in 1839, was destroyed in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, too bad, it looks like it looked like a, a nice building, but uh, it vanished in the Second World War. Germany lost a lot of uh, uh, its, in, in its buildings in that war. And, uh, you know, because of it also, I mean, because of Germany also, many buildings all over Europe and not just Europe were destroyed. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's not a bad building. Now, of course, if you are not in a historic state of mind, you might say, what's so special about it? Well, maybe it's not so so-called special, but it has a sensitivity and, uh, you know, uh, there is a sensitive seriousness here, which we cannot deny. A synagogue. Uh, it was destroyed in 1938 in the terrible crystal nacht, um, uh, crystal night. Um, the building is uh, as it is, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, seen in this picture, maybe it doesn't look so impressive, but uh, uh, the inside, I think I saw a picture, I don't know if I have here, was much richer than the exterior. The Oppenheim Palace, 1845-1848, um, a palace indeed. The influence of, uh, you know, class, so-called classical architecture, Renaissance even, but with a German touch. After this, I will attempt to show the, uh, the uh, video with the, um, with the, uh, uh, review of the works uh, at SciArc uh, responding to the theme weaving, which is very interesting. Uh, the Semper Gallery in Dresden, a large, uh, large building. It escaped the fire of the Second World War. Uh, this is uh, the theater he rebuilt after the fire destroyed the first one. Uh, and uh, this one escaped uh, a similar trage a tragedy. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of a building he built, one of the four buildings he built in Vienna or in Vienna. We'll arrive at, at his buildings in Vienna. I, I don't know, his built work is, is okay, but uh, I think his, uh, in my opinion, his relevance as a theoretician, it might be even higher. Here he is, we saw already. Uh, and in Zurich, after escaping the consequences of taking part in that uh, revolution, I don't know the details, he built a, a building for the Polytechnical School uh, at the Hashi TH in Zurich, which is a prestigious architecture school. Uh, and, uh, you know, find rooms. And it's, it's, uh, it's remarkable that the Swiss uh, can uh, cultivate and promote a very uh, forward looking architecture within, uh, within uh, uh, such a building. So there is no contradiction between, uh, you know, an excellence which was uh, arrived at uh, in the 19th century and uh, 
an excellence uh, aspired towards in the 21st century. Maybe it's not an accident that that uh, beautiful book on uh, constructing architecture uh, of uh, Andreas de Plas uh, mentions uh, often the name uh, Gottfried Semper. He was involved with this school, as we can see, I mean, uh, in a concrete, physical way, by building um, important, uh, important structure for the school. He also built an observatory uh, in, in Zurich, but this building itself is, um, you know, is uh, a, a significant contribution to the architecture of, uh, of Zurich. They are very adventurous. I have seen a few things they did. Uh, the Venice Biennial, uh, you know, uh, was one of them looked like a cave, and it was, uh, you know, very, um, you know, uh, surprising to visually, and even to access it was was uh, required a little bit of an adventure, so to speak. And then, I don't know, uh, four years, four years ago, or five years ago, or three years ago, they did that. Uh, uh, anti neufert uh, uh, you know, arrangement where, you know, they change completely the, the prescribed uh, dimensions of things, you know, uh, with a handle of a door at one, one meter and a half height or the counter in the kitchen to be also uh, not at uh, 85, 90 centimeters, but at uh, uh, one meter, 60 centimeters. So, when you change dimensions, uh, you know, you go anti uh, so called um, natural uh, way, which is not natural at all, actually. Uh, when you go against comfort, you obtain a different kind of architecture, an uncomfortable architecture, but uh, um, enticing, interesting. So yes, in this building, they create and they encourage an architecture that is very unconventional. The observatory from 1861, 1864, uh, it's not an impressive building, but uh, anyway, he did it, he built it. Now in winter, winter tour, in winter tour, he built a city hall, um, almost like a Palladian, uh, you know, structure. Uh, it, it's a city hall, but you can tell that the influence of uh, Palladio and is is was uh, significant on Semper. Not just Palladio, of course, but ancient architecture, the classical orders, the frontal, uh, uh, you know, look of a building that was a temple or whatever. Uh, he, he, he was immersed in history. Vienna. In Vienna, he has four buildings, uh, very important. First, the municipal theater, which in a way resembles a little the building in, in, in Dresden. Uh, and uh, is this one. Uh, right across the street is the city hall of Vienna in a kind of a neo-Gothic uh, architecture. And they also have a great uh, outdoor field festival there. Um, it's interesting in plan, this building. It has so many stairs. I, I mentioned this when I presented his work uh, before. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the plan. Very interesting uh, plan because of that the multitude of, of stairs. Uh, look at this. I mean, it's stair near, there are, I think, nine stairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine, ten stairs. In fact, there is there they are just stairs here, various shapes. Very interesting. And of course, there are many other stairs, uh, you know, within the building. But this amphilad of this myriad of, of stairs makes this this uh, almost unique. I, I I don't know of a similar example. You know, uh, it was a uh, 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 very generous. Um, <laughs> you know, attraction towards stairs that, that was able to manifest itself. It's an interesting idea. And, you know, it's, of course, it's, it's, it's against so-called logic. Why would you place stair near stair near stair? But uh, somehow uh, it's welcoming, no? I mean, those stairs are inviting you in at the various levels of the building. And, uh, you know, they are architectural flowers in a way with which the building uh, honors the, those who enter it, I guess. From the outside, you wouldn't expect, but the idea is kind of interesting to use for a public building, many stairs of various shapes. And if you can see them even from the outside, it would be even better, I think. Anyway, the... <laughs> There are impressive things here going on, no doubt. I mean, uh, that time Vienna was uh, the capital of an empire, and it shows. Now, Kunsthistorische Museum uh, in Vienna, there are two uh, parallel and uh, almost identical, one destined for the um, uh, history of art and the other one for uh, natural history very opulent architectures. And in between these two buildings, uh, almost identical, the statue of Maria Teresa, the, the great uh, empress. Now, you cannot strip these buildings of their ornamentation the, and the chromatics. It's impossible, because if you do, you, you, you destroy them. If I understood correctly what I read by him and about him is that somehow in an almost irrational way, uh, Godfrey Semper seemed to say that, that the ornament preceded structure in the, in the first constructive um, uh, gesture. This is a, an unsettling thought. Uh, in fact, I think we should talk about this. How could ornament precede structure? Now, this is a, you know, a courtyard without glory. <laughs> But uh, inside the building, as you can see, there is a lot of glory. And it's because of, of the contemplative mode of the architect, which resulted in, in this uh, richness of, of, of the motifs, the aesthetical motifs. And art is adding to those, of course. Vienna, the city of walls is, well, it's more to Vienna than just that, of course. But against the city of walls is, I guess, the, the constructivist Wolf Prix uh, reacted. How would it be if we would bring back the sculptor and the painter into our into the into the, the process of erecting buildings? I think it would be a, um, a positive thing. A museum, the Museum of Natural History. Uh, so we see in the fore, uh, foreground uh, the, the great empress Maria Teresa, and then the, in the back um, the big building for natural history. Uh, it's almost identical with the other building that we saw for uh, the history of art.
So the, the immigrant uh, did some great works in Vienna, you know, he was, he was not Austrian, but um, uh, obviously he was received with, uh, with a lot of attention and, and generosity. So you see the two buildings, uh, art and uh, science, or I mean, natural history, and then uh, the Empress here, Maria Teresa. And here across the street is the museum quarters, and, you know, the, all the riches of Vienna are in close proximity. Now, I will end the presentation, this presentation on him with this, uh, in a way, less important work, but for me, very, very uh, uh, appealing, uh, because somehow more modern, because it was stripped of uh, the, the opulence that the other buildings had. Uh, it's a, it was a depot, but, but now it's part of the, the Academy of Fine Arts, and um, I like this building very much also because of the unusual uh, shape of the site plan. Uh, the building has an unusual uh, plan uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a good building. Sorry for the resolution of these pictures. Um, the structure is very, uh, very fine. It's industrial, but also with a touch of humanism which is not done any longer, but at that time it was. And um, yes, uh, a very good building. And look at the, you know, the, the, these are structural, um, but, but structure again is not devoid, is not divorced from ornament, is not divorced from aesthetics. So, you know, this page was probably generated, uh, you know, by by some kind of a collaboration between uh, the architect and the engineer, uh, and uh, it's it's both technical and aesthetically uh, pleasing. And I think when when structure assumes also the other side of the story, aesthetics, uh, it, it it becomes richer and uh, more satisfying and more complex. The building towards outside is fine. It's uh, you know, uh, it's not highly innovative, so to speak. Uh, but um, inside, I think is is uh, is very satisfying. And I like these columns, you know, which are not just utilitarian, but they also have, as I mentioned, uh, an aesthetical uh, dimension. And uh, this makes them uh, more sensitive and uh, thus more pleasing. And here we see some some of the columns as as he uh, as he designed them. A cast iron. It's a good work. And I'm sure the students of the, the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna enjoy it. And they, uh, they have all kinds of events here, exhibitions and so on.
Okay, so I, I, I ended my presentation with, um, with uh, Godfrey Semper.